This week, on Our Thing. A 30-odd years later, Drake had to do the same thing with one of his captains. Acclaimed historical novelist Justin Newland. Because Drake thought that he was provoking a mutiny. And a perilous high seas adventure you will not want to miss. But he had to hang it. Stay tuned for the most entertaining hour in radio. This is Our Thing with everyone's favorite ex-gangster, Gunner, Gunner, Gunner. What's up? Welcome back to Our Thing on 1010 The King with me and my partner in crime, Bill Crook, some Partners in Crime podcast. Theme of our show today is Elizabethan era, right? Yeah. I like historic fiction, by the way. I love going back in time. I could write historic fiction all day for the rest of my life because there's so much to work with. I could just go back into Roman times and just, boom, write stories about emperors and the Senate and the corruption. One of my favorite books that I read when I was in prison is actually a series of several books. I remember perusing the library in prison, which is not that robust, but there's some books in there. And all of a sudden, I come across these very big books. And I like big books. That's a whole other conversation I'd like to get into since I just had a debate with a literary agent when I told him my book was 500 pages. I can't sell a 500-page book. He's like, I can't sell 400 pages, 300 pages. I'm like, the best books typically are the long ones. Not always, but if it's 200 pages, I said, what do they want, a novella? I said, as a reader, I would happily pay five more dollars for a well-developed story where it develops over four or 500 pages and it's got a great story than a hacked up story that could have been great, but it's only 200 pages and I get it for $7.99. As a reader, most readers don't care about the extra five bucks. They want a good story. That's what they're after. And yeah, what are we in a hurry? By the way, when you said you like big books, I don't know why Sir mix a lot came busting in my head, man. <laughs> I like big books and I got that lie. Oh my goodness. I got to use that one with Maria. She'll make a whole song. My <laughs> wife will make a whole song out of it with like poignant lyrics that relate to the time. She's gangster like that. Anyways, so I'm in prison and I'm perusing these shelves. I see these like books. There's like three or four of them. They look like the same books almost. They're publishers and they're hardcovers. And I pull them out. And what it was a story about the ancient Roman Empire is this one general. I can't remember his name. And I don't even know if he was real or not, but he had this really tumultuous relationship in Rome where he was kind of a high power dude trying to take over possibly even become the Caesar. And there's all this Machiavellian deception. Anyways, my point is, I read them and they they were like some of my favorite books ever. I still remember them to this day and it's been like 20 years or whatever. These historic fictions. That's why I enjoy a story like that authors is, you know, you go back in time and you get to relive what it was like at the time. Now, personally, me and Bill were like, well, what are you going to talk about here? I said, well, I'm related to Robert the Bruce. Do you know who that is, Bill? I mean, I know the name, but I don't know anything about him. Yeah, I don't really know much about him either, except William Wallace is thought to be his illegitimate son. You know what I'm saying? Right. From, of course, Braveheart, Mel Gibson. Yeah. Yes, yes. Mel Gibson plays Braveheart and it's William Wallace. And so he has a, obviously a very famous story. But apparently my wife, who's a genealogist, sort of, she gets into it. The thing she gets into, she just dives deep. The first half of my bloodline, the Sicilians, she was super impressed and kind of couldn't believe it. that My bloodline goes all the way back to like Sicily in 1300. It's crazy. And she's like, every single one of your family descendants are all from this one small area of Sicily near Palermo called Terracini, the little town. They're all from there. And every cousin you have, like every Toco, and they're all closely related. You know, they're not like really distant. All the way up to modern times. You know, they're like, they're not first cousins. Some are second, third cousins, but they're all from the same family. There was one man, he had like 12 kids. And so when he had 12 kids, they all kind of split and went their own ways. But for whatever reason, in Sicilian ways, they did marry each other. So some of the cousins actually married each other, which was weird. You know, thinking back to my childhood, I had a, two cousins, and I'm not going to say their names, but they were not like blood, but they acted like brother and sister. And they were almost like dating, you know what I'm saying? And I really found that odd as a kid because i knew they were cousins and they had the same last name and then later what i would find out bill is really interesting this is crazy about my bloodline is two toko brothers married two toko sisters so everybody was toko they married each other all married each other but what ended up happening from those families is that there was a lot of descendants like some of them went my way and some of them went the other way 
but they all basically lived in the same neighborhood. They all grew up for like 60 years, lived in the same general, you know, a couple of mile radius. But is, do, do you think that's weird that like they married each other? Well, it wasn't back then, you know, and especially when you think about outside of the whole third cousin, second cousin. I mean, how many people would marry their third or fourth cousin and not even know because yeah. the names would be different? I'm it's sure. not that big a deal. First cousin, a little weird. By a little, I mean a lot. Yeah. But I don't think it's that weird when it gets into second, third, fourth cousins and stuff. And I don't know what the legal limits are, but it was common. And in Sicily, you couldn't trust everybody. Yeah. Right. So trust and knowing who you are is very, very important there. So it makes a lot of sense that they're like, what are you, third, fourth cousin? Yeah. Good. Yeah. You know, no. we know her. We know her. You're not going to roll in from out of town and marry a Toko girl back in Sicily in the 15th century. I, Just not going to happen. You, you nailed it, bro. You've nailed it. Like you, that, you did a great job of explaining it because... Even as a little kid, I thought it was weird. You know what I'm saying? When my aunt, and I almost said her name, I could say her name. I thought that for a while when I was little, they were brother and sister. And then they started like dating. And I was like, whoa, this is freaking weird, man. And, and like, but I was, at the time, I was only like maybe six, seven years old. Actually, my grandpa told was the one who told me because I was trying to connect the dots between our Toko family and Jack Toko's family, mm-hmm. who's the mom boss of Detroit. And, you know, they were still friends and close and cousins. They were family. But I was like, there's two different lines. So what? how did that happen? He told me his brother married a Toko. I said, wait a minute. His brother's name is Toko. He's like, yeah, he married a Toko. And then that's when my grandpa said, two Toko boys married two Toko girls. And I go, that's kind of weird, creepy, right? Mala, I can see him perfectly. He looks at my grandmother and he got, he kind of laughs. Like he knows it's weird, but what do you, you know, but I guess it's normal. He probably was thinking that's not weird. If you come from where we come from, like our, you know, our ancestors, but to you, it's confusing as a kid to kind of say, eh, something. and it's funny. Right. And there was also something in the Togo clan where somebody was marked for killing in Sicily came over as a cousin, but they raised him as a brother to conceal his identity. So two brothers are not really brothers. They're distant cousins. Well, Dude, okay. That happened in the Toko line. Yeah, dude, I'm glad you brought that up. I know who you're talking about. His name is Joe Toko, and his brother was who he believed to be William Blackjack Toko. Uh, William Vito Toko, Blackjack, they call him. And so his brother, it was his cousin, but he was sent from Sicily and raised by Bill Toko's mother. I think her name was Rosalie Zarelli. Rosalie Zarelli, I could be wrong. And anyways, they were raised as brothers, but really not brothers he not guess he was, he'd be like 21 or 22 years old or around that age when like they finally told him like you're not really brothers you're, you're cousins and they're like what it's crazy but what's interesting about my story is since we're talking about the genealogy in the in the, in the past my great grandfather my grandpa's dad and his name is i think it was salvatore and they called him sam salvatore toco so my grandfather was born in st louis missouri but what happened was is my great grandfather raised my grandfather until he was like five, he had a sister, my aunt. And he, he, I think he got in trouble with the mob or with the law, one or the other. And he's like, I got to go back to Sicily. So he goes back to Sicily and gives his two kids to his brother, Joe, right? He had a brother named Humphrey too. And he says, take my kids until I get back or whatever. So what happened is my uncle Joe, we great uncle, moved to Detroit because he had all these family there, all these people he knew, relatives, family, friends, all the people from the old neighborhood back in the city. So he moved to Detroit into a neighborhood with all these freaking people and started raising my grandparents. But this is where it gets tricky. I can't remember their age. I'm like, I think my grandpa was like 13 and the girl, my aunt was like seven, right? Anyways, they fudged the dates of their births on the documents to make him look younger, I think, so he could take legal possession. I think it was like a law, and his brother couldn't take possession of his kids unless they were a certain age. So they lied. And meanwhile, my great grandfather's back in Sicily hiding from something, and his brother's raising his kids under kind of aliases, you know, different identities. Right. And then when my grandpa was, I don't know, 13, 14 years old, my great grandfather, Sal Toko, he came back to Detroit and took his kids back and then started raising his kid. Well, he had a new wife. Well, unfortunately, she died of uh, the lung disease that, that kills people. Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. Thank you. Yes. And she died really quickly. And she was young, too. And she died with like a year or two. So it's real sad. But anyways, so my great grandfather ended up raising his kids and they all lived in Detroit for the longest time. All the Sicilians in, in Detroit lived in Detroit proper. 
but they also made a lot of money, started hustling and starting businesses and doing what, you know, Sicilians do. And they got a bunch of money. So they left and went to Gross Point. Although my grandfather wasn't really rich by any means, but his father-in-law was. My other great-grandfather, Pietro Lido, this is a crazy story too. He came from Sicily, never spoke a word of English, and he, he started a fruit produce business. But then after four years, he launched uh, a construction company and he started building everything. He started building apartments and houses and uh, Lido Construction. And like within like five years, the guy was like equivalent of a millionaire now. And this, by the way, this is prohibition era times. I mean, if you do the research and look at all his associates, cousins, and people he associated with it, they were all prohibition era gangsters, uh, mobsters. Yeah, there were shortcuts to becoming a millionaire. So yeah, I'm sure he had some help, but he he made a lot of money. And then when my grandfather asked for his daughter's hand in marriage, he said yes. And as a wedding gift, he gave them a brand new house. He built it for him. Anyways, that was pretty interesting down memory lane. But on the other side of my genealogy is I'm related to Robert the Bruce. Who's a king, I believe. Google him up. What do you got on Robert the Bruce? Hang on, let me look at it. <laughs> All right, you ready for this? I'm ready. Robert I, popularly known as Robert the Bruce, was king of the Scots from 1306 to his death in 1329. Robert led Scotland during the First War of Scottish Independence against England, fought successfully during his reign to restore Scotland to an independent kingdom, and is regarded in Scotland as a national hero. He was the fourth great-grandson of King David I, and his grandfather, Robert the Bruce, fifth lord of Annandale, was one of the claimants to the Scottish throne during the great cause. So what the hell does the Bruce mean now? Like, well, what's Bruce? Why is Bruce in there? Robert the Bruce. Can't he be King Robert? I'm guessing it's geographic. The Bruce? Yeah, right. That probably makes sense. He's from Bruce. Yeah, because he's Robert the Bruce, which would be Robert of Bruce. Oh, so that's what Robert the Bruce is. It uh, means you're, that's where you hail from or came from. Or, yeah, 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 usually that's what it is. I didn't even know. I just learned that now. I had no idea. You know, Crooks is a great name yeah it's a great name the way i heard it and you know there were a lot of crooks up in detroit they were up that way there there's a street named crooks up there but uh, oh, yeah what it was was a crook you know it's like a shepherd's crook it's a bend in a river but there was a clan of crooks they were called that because of the bend in the river when people were traveling there's that point that they have to cross the bend they're trapped on three sides and guess what here come the clan <laughs> they rob them and pillage them while they're trapped you know against the river and so they became known as the crooks. Really? That's so, what I've been so doing. Your clan would hide in this river and then, and then rob. Yeah, a bunch of thieving marauders. Yeah. It doesn't surprise me, Bill. It doesn't surprise me. No, I know. It, it made sense. But uh, <laughs> anyway, who knows? But that's what we were Right. Talking. It makes sense, though. Yeah, I get it. Oh, wise guy, eh? And you know what that means? Street Beats with Bill Crooks from Partners in Crime. This is my favorite part of the show where we touch on the latest news in the underworld. If you're not a fan of this type of thing, well, then leave. But if you are, don't leave, don't leave, don't stay leave. true. Well, Bill gives us the latest updates on the cartels and the mafia and all the gangster stuff popping off in the world. Well, here's what's happening in Street Beats. Let me tell you. 13 has long been considered an unlucky number in certain superstitious circles, but it definitely was this week in the Mexican state of Guerrero. The drug cartel war-torn state was the scene of a bloody ambush targeting and killing 13 security officers. The area has long been a dangerous place to be in law enforcement, as evidenced by the assassination attempt on their security secretary in December of 2022. Now, Guerrero, which includes the popular Al Capuco, uh, that's where Bob Barker used to want to send you when your price was right. Yeah, Al Capuco. Yeah, is in the crossfire of massive violence. The skirmishes reportedly escalated after the construction of a new and nearby military facility last year. Two prosecutors were killed in September. And of course, in October of last year, we covered the gunning down of 20 people. That massacre included a mayor and his son. There was an eerily similar ambush, again killing 13 copish types in March of 2021. They lost around 340 law enforcement types last year alone. Wow. Now, the quote unquote officials officially say, well, not much. <laughs> Seems they're a bit tight lipped, but assure the public that they are on a fact finding mission. In summary, if you happen to be the closest bidder on a box of rice aroni in the near future, I'd opt for the cash payout in lieu of a Mexican vacaciones. And that's your street beats. Yeah. 
Wow, dude. I mean, it's funny, man. It's for the longest time, people like Mexicans and people I know who travel down there would be like, listen, if you go to one of these tourist towns, you're safe. Yeah, there's kidnappings and murders and the drugs. And, and they're like, nah, nah, nah. If you go to Cancun or Acapulco or something, you're, you're good to go. Yeah, I used to say that. Cozumel. You know what I'd say to that is? I call BS. I said, because they're going to get there at some point. It's only going to be a matter of time before they infiltrate this and not caring. And, and sadly, the culture in Mexico, the drug culture, it's one of the most horrific evolutions of mankind in history. They've lost all value for life. They're murdering each other left and right. There's no respect for police officers, at least in America, even with the mafia. You know, they, they say, whatever you do, you know, don't kill anyone, especially don't kill a cop. Now they're uh, targeting cops. These guys used to be able to, you could bribe the cops and say, listen, just look the other way and help keep me, you know, posted about other things. And I'll give you a thousand bucks a week or 2000 bucks a week. And they'd be like, eh, okay. But if the people said no to that, then they would kill them or whack them, their family, whatever. Now it's getting to the point where the, the bad guys don't even have to pay them. They're like, listen, you already know to play. If you don't shut up and get off me, we're going to kill you and your whole family. Isn't that crazy, bro? Yeah, that's the complexities of it. And it's right. so many different gang wars, and it's so corrupt. Like, we're assuming a bunch of good cops were going to do the right thing and got ambushed. That's not necessarily the case. Corrupt. They could have been law enforcement that were for Sinaloa, and the new Alistos decided to kill them because yeah. they're on the side of Sinaloa. Yeah. Speaking of Sinaloa, you know, it's always been considered one of the worst places. Guerrero, which is down south, like southwest, way south of Sinaloa, is now bucking for the second most dangerous place in Mexico. Dude. So the landscape's changing. And like I said, they call them like security officers and stuff because a lot of times they're not even cops anymore. You're having to hire your own yeah. police force yeah. privately to get protection. It's a mess down there. It really is. It's so corrupt. It's what our most corrupt politicians are wanting to be. They're praying that someday they'll get away with half the stuff yeah. that they're already getting away yeah. with down in Mexico. Well, our politicians are, are doing it a little different. They're stealing our money through taxes, and it's very surreptitious and well played, really. I, I wouldn't do it, but but the way they've done it is stole it right from under our nose. But with the cartels in Mexico and the politicians, it's just drug money. And, and, and like right. human smuggling, you know, the, between human smuggling and drug money, sure. there's enough money to grease everybody and go around. Yeah, there was a 160 people arrested in Ohio for sex trafficking last week, too. I'll get into that pretty soon. OK, yeah, save that for another street beat. But um, I, I love to hear news like that. And bad guys get got. When I, when I watched that movie, what was it called? Uh, Sound of Sound of Sound of Freedom. Sound of Freedom. Yes, thank you. I was so angry after watching that movie. I hadn't felt violent thoughts like that since prison since the day i left prison like just truly bad violent thoughts where i would revel in hurting somebody and making them suffer the men that do that to these children if they said we need a volunteer to pull the trigger or chop their heads off with a sword or smash their heads in with a bat the sentence is death and we need someone to, to execute the death i would have no problem no problem even with a baseball bat executing that type of person because that's pure evil in my opinion you know what i'm saying Right. And they really pulled on the heartstrings by focusing on the youngest. But uh, even a lot of the sex trade and probably most of the sex trade, right? it's 18 to 20 to 21, but they're still, still. Uh, oppressed. They're still being manipulated. They're still being forced into a sex slavery. Yeah. yeah. Maybe it's not equally horrific, but it's very, very, very yeah, horrific. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I can't imagine, but you could put me in a room with 10 of them guys. Just give me a hammer. Yeah. I think a lot of people feel that way when they yeah. see what's going yeah. on. Uh, you know, there was like, I don't know the numbers, but in Ohio, there's like thousand kids missing or something. It's ridiculous. In Ohio? Yeah. Oh, it breaks my heart, man. Yeah, there's, there's something going on. Okay, looks like we got to take a quick commercial break, but we'll be right back. How would you like to get high-speed internet for about $10 a month with no annual contract? It's possible with Whole Home Connect, your internet superstore. The internet's grown up over the years. There used to be maybe one provider. Now you have multiple choices that you may not even be aware of. Whole Home Connect can help you. With one phone call, they will show you the best internet deals available in your neighborhood. And yes, we have deals as low as $10 a month with no annual contracts. Whole Home Connect is your one-stop discount store for all your internet needs. It's time to upgrade your internet plan and save money. Call right now for a free quote and to learn about internet plans starting at $10 a month with no contracts. Call now, 800-846-2124. Call right now, 800-846-2124. Again, that's 800-846-2124. 
How would you like to get a free $100 prepaid MasterCard and save money on your television bill? Then call right now, make the switch to Dish TV. For a limited time, we're offering a two-year price guarantee. That's important for those of you on a fixed budget to know your prices won't go up for two years. Plus, you have hundreds of channels, lots of live news and sports, movies, and more. And when you call right now, you can also ask about our discounts for seniors and those of you in the military. So, make the switch to Dish right now. Pick up the phone and call. Enjoy your television like you are meant to. And when you sign up today, we'll also give you a $100 free prepaid MasterCard. Call right now, ask about our senior discount, our military discount, and your free $100 prepaid MasterCard. 800-795-5573. 800-795-5573. That's 800-795-5573. Paid for by NPS. Switch to Dish TV today for your free prepaid MasterCard. The old way of living with diabetes is a pain. You've got to remember to do your testing and always need to stick your fingers to test your blood sugar. The new way to live your life with diabetes is with a continuous glucose monitor. Apply a discrete sensor on your body and it continuously monitors your glucose levels, helping you spend more time in range and freeing you from painful finger sticks. If you are living with type 1 or type 2 diabetes and you use insulin or have had hypoglycemic events, you might be eligible for a CGM through your insurance benefits. U.S. Med partners with over 500 private insurance companies and Medicare. We offer free shipping, 90-day supplies, and we bill your insurance. Call us today for a free benefits check. 800-235-2760. That's 800-235-2760. What's up? Welcome back to Our Thing on 1010 The King. And now I'd like to welcome to my show, Justin Newlander from across the pond. I always revel in having authors from around the world. This guy's a very, very interesting author. I look forward to diving into his book and kind of where it came from, his mind, the origin. It's super fascinating. This is one of those guys you're going to love to hear. Justin, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you very much, Gunnar. A real pleasure to be on the show again with you. Oh, it's my pleasure, buddy. So, first of all, you're a very, very smart guy. You have a master's degree, you know, very educated. But ultimately, it is your imagination and your natural creativity that drove you to try and discover what you wanted to create. Are these books set in Elizabethan times, right? Yeah, yeah. This one is, yeah. And so, there, you know, it takes a hell of imagination, plus a lot of research if you want it to be realistic and come across as authentic. But before we get started, tell me a little bit about you, where you're from, and what was the genesis of your writing career? Yeah, great, great. So, yeah, a bit about me. My name is Justin Newland, born in, in Essex in the southeast of England. Too long ago to remember. And since then, I've done various degrees, had various lives, of which author is one of them. Worked in the city of London for 20 odd years. Funnily enough, in some of the locations which are in the book, <laughs> because the city is that old, you know, at least five, six hundred years old. Some of the names of the streets are the same. The buildings, some of them are the same. The churches, some of them are the same. Quite extraordinary. So uh, even then, I was kind of fascinated by it, particularly ancient history. And you mentioned the word Genesis just now, and that was my first novel, actually, The Genes of Isis, set in ancient Egypt. And that got me going about 20-odd years ago to trying to become a decent writer, which I hope I'm on the path to become. So now I've published five novels, of which The Mark of the Salamander, the latest one, is the fifth, just out. And that's the one I think we're going to be talking about, yeah? Yeah. So when you started doing this, like you decided you wanted to write, just quickly, like what was the first thing that sparked your imagination? Like when did that happen and why? Well, I think the two sort of strands that make up a historical fiction writer, which is a love of history and a love of literature, were always there, I guess. You know, I was, you know, I was reading from a young age. These stories, funnily enough, my earliest memory of it is of reading, uh, Eric, I think, a Scottish guy named Eric Linklater who wrote sea stories. And here we are, there I am. Mark of the Salamander is a sea story, really. And I don't know if we really escape the sort of interests and fascinations that we have uh, when we're young, but that's another story. Alongside that developed, I suppose, an eclectic taste in all kinds of literature, plays. I read all the Greek plays and all the myths and got into Egypt and Rome and 
and then read European, American, South American, Russian literature. So yeah, I've lived a few years, I'm getting on, so I've had the time to do all this. You, your interests get stoked from one thing to the next, and, and soon you're off. You know, so I had those two interests, history and literature, and I thought, well, as I get towards the end of my life, I need a project to keep myself busy, to challenge myself. And so I thought, well, I have a go at writing. That was the genesis. It's funny because I've had lots of historic fiction writers. I'm sure in the UK, there's a lot of literature about the British, the whole history of the English. But I haven't encountered a ton of them about that era that you're writing about. Plus, there's like a spiritual element to your Mm. writing. Very philosophical, gives a different perspective. And you put the reader in that place in that time. And I think that's something we all wonder, you know what I'm saying? We all wonder what it was like to live back then. Well, I'd say at the beginning of the opening section of the novel, I had these sayings. And one of them I found was the motto of Francis Drake, who, uh, as you know, sailed around the world. Now, the motto in Latin is sic parvis magna. And that means out of small things, great things arise. That, in a way, it describes every birth that's ever happened. <laughs> I mean, look at an oak tree. It takes an acorn to create a gigantic Uh, oak tree. Exactly. It's the same with one seed of an idea. And I'll tell you what that was, which gave me the inspiration for this book. I wanted to write about Elizabethan England. Now, I came across Francis Drake's crew, the names of the crew and what they did. And it was in this sort of research I was doing. And it had this guy called Neelan. And so he's actually the sort of the hero of the story from his point of view. And all it says is that he was an ordinary seaman which is basically the lowest of the low, and he was a Flemish immigrant. Flemish is from Flanders, which is in northern France, between Poland and Belgium and France, sort of up by Calais area, just for your listeners. So basically, this book, this novel, I wrote about his backstory. That's all I had to start with, that germ, that seed. So did you make it up or did you have some kind of material? I made it up. But obviously, I tied it in with the history of the time. Yeah. What made this character remarkable or stand out? Well, I wanted to play with some um, of the astrological influences of the time. Because even in Elizabethan times, in the courts, they were heavily into astrology. Yeah. Okay? The different star signs, Capricorns and Saturns and Libra. That's how and... they navigated on the sea, right? Yeah, yeah. So they know all these constellations and all the rest of it. And I also wanted to introduce a very mysterious and enigmatic figure called John Dee. He was the astrologer, counsellor to Queen Elizabeth in her court. Okay. So when this guy, Neelan, a fugitive from the Spanish who had invaded the Netherlands, the Holland, because they had a claim to the throne and they were Catholic, but the Dutch were Protestant, So he's ejected out of Holland with his father and goes to live in a place called Mortlake on the River Thames, east of London. It just so happens to be right next to a neighbour to Dr. John Dee. So that's how I introduce some of these more spiritual elements, which you mentioned, because that's what he's into. So he's a young man. He goes to a Westminster school, uh, which had just been started at the time. Now, Now, wasn't he wanted for murder? Yeah, he had some rivalry with a pair of brothers who lived in a house nearby, but they were of Spanish descent, and so were Catholic. And Catholics were sort of tolerated in Elizabethan England, as long as they went to Mass and behaved themselves. So they were going to this Westminster school, and the story starts, the opening chapter, is that he's falsely accused of killing or murdering one of the brothers, but it wasn't actually his fault. He killed him and it wasn't his fault, or he didn't kill him? Uh, well, no, I don't want to tell you the plot. He, he didn't kill him, <laughs> uh, but he died. Um, and the people who saw the incident saw only the end of it, not the beginning of it. And so from the evidence they'd seen, they assumed that he had killed him. But anyway, that's what they call the inciting incident. So he's now on the run, and he has a bit of an adventurous spirit. And does he volunteer or get hired to join this crew on the sea? And from this point, he starts to kind of discover a much bigger world, spiritually, literally, geographically. And he goes on this intense adventure, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Francis Drake wanted to emulate uh, the Spanish and the Portuguese navigators, And the year they were talking about here is 1579, the late 1570s. And this is all real history, which I love about this book. 
I love that it's it's you know you're writing real history into the story. So people who read this story will think, is this real? Is this really based on like they're going to think it's real? Yeah, that's why I find it fascinating to write history because you can kind of extend the boundaries a little bit, and because it's exactly that kind of doubt that I want to insert into the reader's mind to say, well, which bit's history and which bit's not. And I don't want them to know. Yeah, they should. When they're reading, yeah. it should become so real based on the history and knowledge of that time. Mm. You don't have to be like an expert on history like that. It'll be a fascinating story because it's a well-written, well, plot-driven, character-driven story. But right away, you'll get sucked into it. And before you know it, this is real. In your mind, when you finish the book, I'm like, this guy was totally real. This is part of history. Yeah, well, he was. Right. And it's interesting that it's 1579 because the Elizabethan era, that would have put it right dab in the middle, right in the thick of the era. Yeah, that's I right. I think it went from 1558 to uh, 1603, right? That's right. Yeah, you got it, Bill. And there was a lot of religious and spiritual kind of conflicts between countries and areas and neighbors. Yeah. There's a lot of different beliefs. So there's that that tension. Hey, Donna, it was new. Yeah. Right, right. It's true. <laughs> Nothing's changed. But it's also a golden age of music and literature, too. So Yeah, yeah. Everything's flaring. So, you know, you, you mentioned that Neyland's sort of MO was one of exploration and adventure. And I wanted to use that as a kind of metaphor for England wanting to uh, explore and develop its own destiny in the world, if you like. Um, that's, that's really what I was interested in doing and still am. You know, as an Englishman, I want to know, what's it all about? How do we get here? Yeah, I think a lot of people believe that the British were just about colonizing the world and aggregating resources for the empire. But really, what happened is most of these were like Columbus type of people, going out to try yeah. and explore the world. But if the government would fund it, they'd put together a team of explorers and they would go out and, yes, they conquered, yeah. yes, they colonized. But still, I think it was just as much an adventure series for the time as it was to conquer resources. But Britain always thought they were invited. They didn't infiltrate anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. So, I mean, one of the things, for example, I was going to mention that still exists today, which I devote a chapter or two in the book, is a ceremony called Crossing the Line. When Francis Drake crosses the line, which is the equator, there is a ceremony, even today, quite, certainly in the American Navy, if not the British and other navies, that when a sailor first crosses the equator, there is a particular ceremony, often involved with dousing them in water or whatever, to mark the occasion. So that exists today, and it goes all the way back to then. That was the time, for example, when the hammock was discovered, as you believe. You know, he used to just sleep on straw. Beds were made of straw in those days. Oh, really? That's interesting. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, there's a lot. You know, I mean, Columbus, you mentioned, he, like a lot of sailors of the time, they would take doves in cages with them, okay? And what Columbus would do, every now and again in the middle of the ocean, they'd let the doves go free, right? Now, there were two things that could happen. One is the doves would fly around and fly back to the ship, and they would know that they're too far from land. Otherwise, if the doves don't come back, they look in the direction the doves fly and they know which way the land is. So they used birds and they used fish, the, the routes that the fish took, in order to do primitive navigation, if you see. Because they knew the birds and the fish knew better than they did. <laughs> Bill, you know? can you imagine going out on the sea on a primitive wood sailboat and saying, listen, we're going to try and find land that we don't even know exists and then you just go out on this boat and sail, navigating by the stars, these primitive methods. And you don't even know if you're coming home. And the truth is, a lot of them didn't come home. Probably more than came home didn't come home. They sailed off. They got in a storm. They were wiped out. They were killed. You know, so you got to have brass balls to think, I'm going to jump in part of this crew and I'm going to go sail around the unknown world. I think they were just the human spirit is adventurous and the human spirit wants to know what's out there. So they would aggregate a crew of like very adventurous spirited people that would work together as a team and go find these places. And that is how the known world was found for people like this. And of course, it ended up sadly conquering a lot of people. But I, I have a feeling, and this is just my theory, is that most of these people, the Columbus types and the Francis Drakes and they weren't out there looking for gold and conquer people. It wasn't their mission. Their mission was adventure and discovery. Am I right? Uh, you, you are right, uh, Ikana. That's my assessment too. As best we can understand their mentality today, 
I agree that I think there's something else to add, which is there is something about the sea which attracts certain men and, and possibly women. There, there's certain elements in the sea, certain mysteries, if you like, I think, which attract men. And they love the movement and the, the changes of the moods of the sea, the sirens. It scares the hell out of me. Yeah, it does me as well. Yeah, I'm out. You know, as far as navigating, I can barely navigate my way out of a Walmart, you know? Yeah, I know what you mean. Right. And, and you got a GPS. Yeah. But... Also, I'm thinking storms. Immediately, I'm thinking storms when you're out there in the ocean. Yeah, yeah, I know. And not just storms, but doldrums as well. You know, the calms. Yeah, no wind. They can't move. Sometimes they'd be laid up for like a week at a time. They, they lay out sails on the deck. Right. To get any rain, because, of course, fresh water was an absolute premium, you know, and they would gather it in, in the sails laid out on the deck. Quite extraordinary practice. Terrifying. Yeah, all that taken in, though, if I'm wanted for murder, it's starting to look pretty good. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, uh, yeah. But, yeah, I, I think the spirit of adventure is fantastic. An uh, element of the human spirit, you know, it really is. Okay, hold up. Looks like we've got to take a quick commercial break, but we'll be right back. Have you ever met a single person in your life that enjoys paying taxes? No, no one does. If you can't sleep at night because you have a huge problem with the IRS, I've got some free advice for you. This service is strictly limited to individuals that owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes. And if you qualify, we can guarantee that you won't be writing a big fat check to the IRS or our services cost you nothing. The first 100 people that call today will get a free tax consultation worth $500. Stop worrying about your IRS problem. We can help you. We promise. Call the tax doctor right now. I mean right now to learn more. 800-322-8714. 800-322-8714. That's 800-322-8714. Now you can get generic Viagra shipped to your door for about two dollars a pill get the same impact for less call steel man pills now and get the same blue pill for about two dollars a pill call now for the 50 pill special and save even more plus get a free bonus 800-870-3609 800-870-3609 800-870-3609 that's 800-870-3609 hey have you checked out our thing apparel it's the original gangster clothing brand that lets you represent where you live. Featuring t-shirts, hoodies, vintage tracksuits, and more. Our Thing Apparel allows you to customize your clothing for your city or state. And now, we're proud to launch our Atlanta line of urban casual wear. Check out OurThingApparel.com and use the promo code 1010 when checking out to get 10% off your total order. Make our thing your thing. Let me tell you a story about Bill. Bill was a normal guy in his 50s. He had back surgery about two years ago. Bill was in a lot of pain. He dealt with his pain by taking the Percocets his doctor prescribed for him. Bill took more and more and more of them to help with the pain until one day the prescriptions weren't enough to get rid of Bill's pain. Then one day Bill found someone to help him get rid of the pain with illegal drugs he didn't need a prescription for. Fast forward to today. Bill lost his job and his family. The only thing he does have is his drug dealer. If you know Bill's story and you don't want to end up like Bill, call the Detox and Treatment Helpline right now to get away and get treatment. 800-762-6158. 800-762-6158. That's 800-762-6158. Welcome back to Our Thing on 1010 The King. Justin Newlander. I love history and I love discovering these type of stories. And I imagine in the book you work in a lot of crazy adventures, you know, between the storms and the doldrums and the encounters with indigenous people. Hey, hey Gunnar, they're not crazy. I just follow the history, mate. Yeah, no, no, they're real. Yeah, I know. No, but you you may have made up some, you know, to just for... Yeah, yeah, I may have made up one or two. Yeah, and I'm sure there's a lot of conflict on board, too. Meaning different personalities that you develop in the characters. Oh, yeah, you got it. Some don't like each other, some do. There's teams, there's mutiny and sabotage. Oh, you you don't know the half of it, Mike. Right? Yeah, 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 I tell you. 
you know, you did brilliantly described the mindset they would have had going into that voyage. When they set out, they thought they were going to Egypt. They thought they were going to what they call the Levant. Yeah. And actually, they ended up going down past Morocco, across to the Canaries, and then across the Atlantic to Brazil. Wow. And by that time, <laughs> the crew quickly sorted out that they weren't going to Egypt. So they were lost? No, no, no. This is the route they were taking. But if they thought they were going to Egypt and ended up in Brazil, yeah. they didn't know where the hell they were going. Well, they had to be told that the actual route they were taking was to go around the world. And just as a matter of course, they had to go around the world in a particular direction because they weren't allowed to go eastwards because the Pope had told the Portuguese that only they could go to the east, right? which was why the Portuguese developed places like Goa and the Philippines, because they got there first. And that's why the Spanish, who had to go westwards down to Brazil and across to South America and North America, why the Spanish developed most of those countries. Mm, that makes sense. I didn't know that. All because the Pope said that's the way it had to go. You know, he divides up the riches of the world, which, of course, he doesn't own at all. But anyway, that's another story. So anyway, they're facing the unknown, and um, there's a mutiny. It happened with Magellan. He's the one who first went around the world. Yes. And he had to spell a mutiny of his captains down in Patagonia. Now, talk about history repeating itself. Uh, 30-odd years later, Drake had to do the same thing with one of his captains, a guy named Thomas Doughty. He had to hang him because Drake thought that he was provoking a mutiny. And of course, like you said, you had to have everybody on board because the boats are so small, the risks are so great. If everybody's not pulling in the same direction, you all are gone up. I can only imagine, Bill. Dude, that's crazy. I mean, like you said, all it takes is one guy to say, man, this is some BS, bro. We're lost. I don't know where the hell the captain's taking us. We're all going to die. And then all of a sudden, everyone's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to mutiny. We're going to kill the captain and take over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, we want to go home, you see. Right. Well, I've always heard, too, I don't know how true this is, but you always see them swabbing the deck and all that. But you got to give these guys something to do and keep them yeah. busy or they're going to sit around and think things yeah. like that. Exactly. They, you know, and they're, they're drinking rum and drinking ale because, of course, they can't drink water because the water, in, certainly in the country, was, was defiled. So everybody drank beer. You know that. And they had their tots of rum. Well, I think they might come in later. I can't remember. The ship's looking better and better. Uh, yeah, that's right. The more rum they drink, the better this voyage seems. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, and then I'm weaving this whole thing about salamander. That's the title of the novel, The Mark of the Salamander. I wanted to give Neelan some sort of interest in the esoteric world and the, the mysteries of the sea and the mysteries of life. And there was some philosophies of the time, a guy named Paraclesis, who was a German sort of uh, Austrian philosopher. And he came up with a lot of new ideas about the occult, if you like. And one of them was that once you had earth, air, fire, and water, the four elements, you had a spirit of each one of them. So the spirit of earth was a gnome. Okay. You heard of gnomes. I mean, yeah. spirit of water was an undying. Spirit of air was a sylph. And the spirit of fire was a salamander. Ah. So these are kind of mysterious elemental beings yeah. that occupied the space of our world, if you like, and occasionally manifested to certain people. And that's the kind of thing I wanted to play with in the novel. Yeah. Because they were beliefs they had at the time. So I thought, well, I'm going to use these things and introduce them, you know, and make the novel a, a different kind of adventure story. Yeah, with some spirituality and some yeah, yeah, some discovery and stuff like that. So I'm a big fan and proponent of this type of story, and I hope you know, people who are listening like take a chance and at least read the blurb in the blog, read the book, check it out, check out his history, especially if you're a fan of history and historical fiction. Anyone who's a fan of that will love this book, you know. Right, his reviews, if you go to his thing on Amazon, and we'll give all the links and stuff, they're all five-star reviews. And one person said, like, it started off, I got my master's degree in Elizabethan history, so it's set up to be a troll. And they're like, he nailed it. I felt like I was there. I was transformed to the place. And so it doesn't get any better than that. That's the ultimate compliment. When you have somebody like that, like you said, is like, listen, I'm an expert on this subject, and this guy nailed it. I mean, that's one hell of a compliment right there. Yeah, it is. But not, not everybody likes the treatment. You know, they, that's very nice of obviously somebody to say that. And it is, is hopefully the reviews will grow. It's only it's only been out since late September. So here we are, late October. So there's only a month it's been out. So um, obviously I'm trying to, you know, 
talking to good folks like yourself get get it out there you know yeah so we'll do our best we'll certainly do our best i'm going to put yeah. at my website my personal website is a featured author and then after the show archive show will be on spotify and all, and all the podcast platforms can i read a little bit because before we're running out of time yeah please this is from chapter six of the novel it's called elena elena and it's got a little bit of the love element in the story and i hope you enjoy it so it's, it's about a page so you have to have we'll see how we go once the liturgy had finished, he left the church with Eleanor. The weather was dry but bitterly cold as they walked down St. Martin's Lane to the Strand. Eleanor wanted to go home, but Leland took her by the hand and led her towards the top of White Hall. Here, come this way, he said. Let me show you something. The stone cross was a head, the one he'd seen a few days before. Needle-like, the frost had made it shimmer in the winter sun. Together they watched the other couples leave the church. As they passed the cross, each one paused for a moment's silent remembrance. The men pressed their caps to their hearts. The women bowed their heads. Some shed a solitary tear. Others walked on lost in thought. This is poignant, Eleanor said. What's so special about this cross? Edward I accompanied his wife of many years when she died near Lincoln, Neelan said, in the north of England. The king brought her body back to London on a bier. At each of the twelve stops along the way, he erected a memorial to her. A cross. A charing cross. I didn't know that, Ellen said, holding back a tear. And these ordinary folk, they show such deep respect. On a freezing day, it warms the cockles of your heart. People behaved the same the other day when I came here, Neelan said. I wanted to share this special place with you and what it means. What was the name of his queen? she asked. Nina looked her softly in the eye and whispered, Eleanor. Oh, but that that's my name, she said, choking on the emotion. It's also called Eleanor's Cross. Nina, you brought me here. You thought of me. That's kind. Thank you. It's a wonderful story of a love that lasts beyond death and into the afterlife. The moist sparkle in her eyes warmed her inside. I wonder, she moved, pressing his hand into hers, is the fire of love between a man and a woman immortal? Perhaps one day we'll find out, he murmured. Impervious to the cold, Neelan glowed inside with a subtle fire of love and the living of it, each moment quickening the next. Love resided in the way a precious flower returned each spring with gentle petals and an exquisite aroma, ever present and never to be forgotten. The presence of the Eleanor Cross embraced them both, it represented an idea larger than life itself. He was filled with the glory of love, of living and of sharing that instant, which was like an enduring string of milk-white pearls, joined one to the next, always there, never-ending. For would there not be love tomorrow and the next day? Would a Chinaman not love a woman with the same passion as an Englishman would love his? Would the same reverence for living and for life itself not course through their veins? The timeless moment held them in its sway, a spirit clamp watched by more than just the two of them. It seemed as if other eyes looked through theirs to see what they saw, a witness to what they had witnessed. A sublime moment of beauty and belonging was the nearest to a religious experience that Neelan had ever had. So I hope you enjoyed that. That was yeah, eloquent. It's I loved it. It's beautiful. It's okay. Like a bit of a bit of the spiritual element in that right one. yeah so there's a spiritual element there so he's he's a man who believes in spirituality and love and things like that and i bet you on uh, that whole story love story will play out through the story yeah yeah yeah. maybe he's always thinking of her maybe he's in love with her maybe he wants to get back to her but you know love is powerful and every great story needs a love story everyone you can't have a great story without a, a romantic interest a powerful romantic interest would you agree bill yeah, I agree 100%. And I think one of the great things when you hear something like that that's so well written, it rubs off on you. It changes the way you think. You think in a more intelligent and articulate way. So this kind of book really you know, gets me going. I, I okay, love thanks for saying, Bill. You learn character and charisma and chivalry and literary. You're expanding your literary prowess by simply reading books like this, going back in time and See how people talk, act, and engage each other in a different time and place opposed to how people do now. It was a different time and place. And in some ways, I'd say better, and in some ways worse. History is history. I'm not the judge. But um, today, we have so much wrong in our society that I personally would rather go back to that 
Elizabethan time and where mm. there is chivalry and honor and respect and spirituality and, and all the things that, that uh, helped them build this massive empire, the greatest empire in the history of the world, really, the British Empire. Yeah, there's also a fair amount of uh, head yeah, chopping. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you do understand that that place, Eleanor's Cross, Charing Cross, is in London. Is the centre of London, Charing Cross. It's still there. That's the same place. Yeah. It's no. still there. It's not the same cross because they rebuilt it in, in Victorian times, but it's the same place near St. Martin's Church, which still exists. I've been in it many a time, near Trafalgar that's Square. Crazy. So that's why, you know, you say history is alive. It really is. It's, it's around the corner <laughs> in London. As it is in everywhere. I love history and I love discovering these type of stories. They're amazing. And the British Empire has incredible stories. And again, these days, everything is demonized from the colonization and all that. But if you go yeah. back in time to some of those beautiful places, architecture, art, there's incredibly romantic stories that, that took place. A lot of honor, the fighting you know, with each other, even when they were conquering. There was so much honor, like in the military and the way they fought and had took pride in the, the empire and the, and the crown. And it's kind of a lost thing, but there's so much history there to revel in. And I'm sure it all unfolds in your book in a very dramatic and cinematic way. Not a history lesson, but if you read the book, you, you'll get a history lesson. But you also get a great story with great characters and a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. I mean, there's one example of what you're talking about. Drake had sailed up the Pacific coast of South America, up um, the coast of Peru. And he's looking for the Spanish treasure ship because every year the Spanish, all the, all the silver and gold that they mined from uh, the Potosi mines in Peru would get loaded onto a ship and, and loaded up from Calau, I think it was called, up to the Isthmus of Panama on the Pacific side, right? And normally what they do is they'd transfer the silver and gold on a mule train across the isthmus, the narrow isthmus of Panama, to load onto another boat on the other side at Nombre de Dios, Spanish port. Uh, and then they sailed the ship with the silver and gold to Spain. So Drake was going up the Pacific side, and he comes across this boat and, and boards it and nicks all the silver and gold. But what he then does, and, and this is to follow up your story, is that he invites all the officers and the captain of the ship that he's just taken, he invites them to dinner. So he invites the Spanish officers to dinner, and they have a meal together, and they they share their food. They share he shares everything After with them. After he just robbed them, basically. After he just robbed them, yeah, it was very nice of him. <laughs> Chivalry, <laughs> he could do right. So yeah, of course. But what he then does, and this this was common at the time, he then asked them. He said, "Look, you can have your ship back only if you promise that when you get back to Spain or South America, you don't then sail again against the English." And they promised, but they broke their promise. Of course they did. So that's how it played out. Well, this is all great stuff. It is. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. I enjoy it. And I and enjoy having you on. So before we go, tell us where they can find you and your books and everything right now so we can get that out. You can get my book on my website, justinnewland.com. If you go on there, you can even put in a dedication and I can send it to you. That's probably a good way, but you can also obviously in the States get it from amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, and what have you. This is a great book for a gift. The holiday season coming up, if your spouse or mother or brother or cousin, anyone who's interested in like that type of history, historical fiction, this is a perfect gift. So make sure yeah. to go to justinnewland.com. He will send you a personalized signed book. If you're in America, go to Amazon and get it. You won't get it signed, but yeah, you'll yeah, get it. Yeah. It makes a great gift. Do you have any social media, anything else you want to direct people to? Yeah, I've got a Facebook page on Instagram. Dr. Justin Newland, I think, on Instagram. Justin.newland, the author, I think, on Facebook. Great. Well, thank you. And it's been a pleasure having you on again. I really enjoyed it. I'm sure we could sit here and talk for hours. We have more time. We, we could, can we? Yeah, these history lessons, I'm into them. But I would love to go back and you know talk more. But maybe we'll have you on again. But best of luck. Yeah. With the book. Not that you need luck. I think this is one of those books. That certainly, luck's not involved. This is talent. This is research. You know, this is passion, and that's what this show is really all about. Yeah. Is you take passion, research, and talent, mix it up in a bowl, and out comes this beautiful literary masterpiece that people can enjoy around the world. I hope people check it out. That's another one. Bill, anything to add before we go? As always, if you check out our archived episodes on Spotify, our Heart Radio, wherever podcasts are consumed, you will look at the show notes, and we will have all his links to all the ways you can reach out to him. Make sure to tune in next week on Our Thing, 1010 The King, and that's one in the books. God bless. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.